fun part. So, good morning. I'm Joan Shigekawa, Acting Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts and the 184, 181st meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now in session. So I would like to welcome everyone this morning, council members, NEA staff, colleagues here in person, and everyone watching online at arts.gov. For the record, the council members who are present are music educator and arts researcher Bruce Carter from Miami Beach, Florida, violinist and educator Aaron Dworkin from Ypsilanti, Michigan, musician Lee Greenwood from Nashville, Tennessee, attorney, musician, and former member of Congress Paul Hodes from Concord, New Hampshire. Arts consultant, Joan Israelite from Kansas City, Missouri. Urban planning and community policy specialist, Maria Rosario Jackson from Los Angeles, California. On this side. Arts administrator, Maria Lopez de Leon from San Antonio, Texas. Author and organic farmer Mas Masumoto from Delray, California. And visual artist Barbara Ernst Prey from Oyster Bay, New York. On the phone we have philanthropic professional Deepa Gupta from Chicago, Illinois. And music professor and arts administrator Emil Kang from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So let me say once again, on behalf of President Obama and all of our colleagues here at the NEA, thank you. We're grateful for your stewardship, for your counsel, for your dedication to arts and culture, and for your service to the American people. There are also three new council members with us today, and I am thrilled to introduce you to Rick Lowe, Rani Ramaswamy, and Olga Viso. So let me give you some background about each one. Rick Lowe is the founder of Project Row Houses, a neighborhood-based nonprofit art and cultural organization in the Northern North Ward, Northern Third Ward, sorry, um, one of the oldest African-American communities in Houston, Texas. He has participated in national and international community arts organizations and exhibitions and programs since 1995. In 2012, Rick was an artist in residence at the Community Innovators Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and at Tjensta Kunsthal in Stockholm, Sweden. He was a master artist at the Atlantic Center for the Arts in 2011 a visiting artist at the Otis College of Art in Los Angeles, California in 2010, and a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design from 2001 to 2002. Rick has served as a board member of the Menil Foundation and received the Creative Times Lenore Annenberg Prize for Art and Social Justice in 2010. The United States Artist Fellowship in design in 2009, and the Heinz Award in the Arts and Humanities in 2002. We're so glad to have you with us, Rick. Since 1972, yes, yes, we finally got Rick. Since 1978, Rani Ramaswamy has been a master choreographer, performer, and teacher of the South Indian classical dance form, Bharatnatyam. She founded the Ragamala Dance Company in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1992. Her work has been commissioned by the Walker Arts Center, the American Composers Forum, and the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and has been supported by the National Dance Project, 
and the Joyce Foundation. Ronnie's tours have also been highlighted by the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the American Dance Festival, and the National Center for Performing Arts in Mumbai, India. Among her numerous grants and awards are 14 McKnight Fellowships, a Bush Foundation Choreography Fellowship, and an Artist Exploration Fund grant from Arts International. So welcome, Ronnie. And lastly, we welcome Olga Viso, who is Executive Director of the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which ranks among the five most visited modern contemporary art museums in the United States. Prior to her tenure at the Walker Arts Center, Olga held positions at the Smithsonian Institution's Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, starting as an assistant curator and becoming director in 2005. Olga was a curator at the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach from 1993 to 1995 and held several curatorial and administrative positions at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Georgia from 1989 to 1993. She serves on the board of directors of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and is a member of the Association of Art Museum Directors. From 2003 to 2006, she served on the Federal Advisory Committee on International Exhibitions known around in these halls as FACI. So, Olga, welcome to the NEA. So, Rick, Ronnie, and Olga, although you have already been sworn in so that you could participate in the preparations for today's meetings, I now have the pleasure of publicly administering your oath of office. So would you all please stand, raise your right hand, and, re and repeat after me. I, and then say your name. I, the flow, all the paper. <laughs> okay, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Shall we do it again? Okay. Uh, okay, we'll push on. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear true faith, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge well and faithfully the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So ladies and gentlemen, please officially welcome the three newest members of the National Council on the Arts. This is such a great council. Would, would any of you like to make any remarks before we launch into um, the next phase of the meeting? You're welcome to do so. OK, we'll hear from you in the Q&A. Um, so let us begin the business we have before us this morning. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of our November council meeting? OK. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Now we will move to the council members' votes and their application and guideline review. I would like to invite our deputy chairman for programs and partnership, Patrice Walker-Powell, to take us through this section of the meeting. Thank you, Joan. Again, I thank the council members, the directors, and our staff for their attentiveness to the applications under consideration. Please be patient with me as over the next few minutes, 
we will take time for the formal application review and guidelines review sections of this agenda. The tally of votes will be announced at the end of today's session. This morning, the council will be voting by ballot on grant recommendations totaling nearly $80 million in three funding areas, artworks, state and regional partnerships, and leadership initiatives. These funding recommendations are found in the corresponding sections of the March immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. In order for your vote to be tallied, you must be present at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council members' affiliations have been recorded in the council book and are attached to your ballots. Each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Before voting, council members should review the list of recommendations and rejections and add to the list provided in your folders any affiliations that may be missing. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes part of the agency's official record. After brief summaries of the three funding areas, the council members will have an opportunity to ask questions and or discuss the recommendations before voting by ballot. May I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under Artworks, Partnership, and Leadership in the council materials? Second. Thank you. Now I will summarize the three funding areas on which you will be voting and then pause for any comments or questions from council members. First, the artworks category is the agency's primary category of funding for the arts disciplines. It encourages support in the following four outcomes. Creation, the creation of art that meets the highest standards of excellence. Engagement, public engagement with diverse and excellent art. Learning, lifelong learning in the arts and livability, the strengthening of communities through the arts. These projects that are recommended for funding are the second group of applications in this category brought to the council this fiscal year, fiscal year 2014. The first half was considered at the November meeting last year. Using rounded figures for the August 2013 deadline, the agency received 1,515 eligible applications requesting more than $76 million in 2014 support. Recommended for the council's approval are 888 projects totaling up to $25,905,500. Grants are recommended to 58% of all applicants with amounts ranging from $10,000 to $100,000 and an average grant in the amount of $29,000. Recommended projects span 13 disciplines, and 13 disciplines and fields and they focus primarily on the creation of work and presentation of both new and existing works to the American audiences. Creation and presentation takes the form of commissions, collaborations, original productions, exhibitions, performances, tours, film festivals, artist residencies, literary publications, art in public places, and services to the field. Direct grants are recommended to 49 states, Puerto Rico, and the District of Columbia. Are there any questions or comments from the council? Please mark your ballots. Next, the NEA State and Regional Partnership Agreements, which assist the nation's state arts agencies and regional arts organizations in their support for the arts. By law, 40% of the arts endowments appropriated program funds are awarded in this manner. State arts agencies will utilize NEA support in combination with state appropriated funding to support cultural organizations, schools, and artists in producing art projects in communities across the country. This year, a total of $39,800,000 is being recommended to the states and another $8 million recommended for the regions. Are there any comments or questions from the council? Please mark your ballots. Next, NEA leadership initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and fieldwide significance. At this meeting, the council is requested to approve funding for 43 projects in six arts disciplines or fields, totaling more than $5 million. 
continuing support is requested for the Arts Education Partnership, a consortia of more than 130 national organizations representing the arts education fields, as well as government and the private sector. The Arts Education Partnership promotes the essential role of the arts in enabling every student to, su to succeed in school and reach high levels of achievement and competence in the arts. Poetry Out Loud, which encourages the nation's youth to learn about great poetry through memorization, recitation, and performance. Poetry Out Loud helps students master public speaking skills and learn about their literary heritage. The National Arts Education Data Project, which over the upcoming few years will present and aggregate data on arts education access and participation for more than 50 million students in nearly 100,000 public schools throughout the United States. The NEA's National Heritage Fellowships and Awards Ceremony. Art Links Residencies, an international exchange program for artists and arts managers from Central Europe, Russia, and Eurasia to participate in residencies with U.S. organizations as well as U.S. Artist International, a program that showcases the excellence, the excellent diversity and vitality of U.S. artists and arts organizations to attend international festivals around the world. USAI supports the participation of U.S. artists at other significant cultural events abroad. The Big Read, an initiative to enhance literature's role in American culture. The NEA Jazz Masters Fellowships and Awards Ceremony, and 21 projects in research artworks, which will build evidence about the value and impact of the arts, as well as encourage strong partnerships and exchanges of information among researchers. Are there any comments or questions from the council? Please mark your ballots. If you are voting, joining us via teleconference, you may now mail your votes to Kim Jefferson on these three funding areas. Also, there are two projects under the awards updates tab in your council book. These grants have been awarded under the chairman's delegated authority and brought to the council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. Included are 148 Challenge America Fast Track grants in 44 states and one 20% amendment. Thank you all. Now we move to the guidelines review portion of the agenda. At this meeting, the council is being asked to consider three sets of 2015 guidelines, NEA National Heritage Fellowships, NEA Jazz Masters Fellowships, partnership agreements. I will now invite Jillian Miller, Director of the Office of Guidelines and Panel Operations, to summarize the guidelines up for vote at this meeting. Jillian. Thanks, Patrice. Good morning. As she said, you've got three sets of guidelines up for your review, and they're all renewals of existing categories. Your first two sets of guidelines are for the agency's two honorific fellowship categories. The NEA National Heritage Fellowships honor master folk and traditional artists. There are no changes to these guidelines. Next are the NEA Jazz Masters Fellowships, which honor master jazz artists. Here, we're adding language to encourage nominations of a broad range of men and women who have been significant to the field of jazz. Your third and last set of guidelines is for partnership agreements. These guidelines define the agency's funding to its state and regional partners, and there are a couple of things to highlight for you. For the states, consistent with our new legislation, we're clarifying that the one-to-one -one match must come from state government funds that are directly controlled and appropriated by the state and directly managed by the state arts agency. For the regional arts organizations, or RAOs, there are a few things. We've updated the description of the RAOs and the guidelines to reflect their evolution over time. When making our funding allocation decisions, we'll take into consideration the number of states participating in an RAO. We've also edited the review criteria and eligibility requirements for greater clarity, and we're providing greater flexibility for the use of NEA regional touring funds. Now, up to 15% of touring funds may be used for in-state touring under certain circumstances. Thank you, Jillian. Are there any comments or questions from council members? 
If not, may I have a motion to approve the guidelines? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Just want to comment. Have you got a photographic memory? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you, council members. I turn the agenda back over to Acting Chairman Chicago. Yeah, isn't it dazzling? <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Patrice, and thanks, Jillian. I'm going to stand up and bring you up to date with a few council updates. So before we begin our presentations, I'd like to share a few updates with you. We'll start with the announcement that I'm sure that most of you all already know, which is that Jane Chu was recently nominated by President Obama to serve as our new chairman. Jane has headed Kansas City's Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts since 2006 and we look forward to supporting her throughout the confirmation process. Under President Obama's leadership, the National Endowment for the Arts has been guided by a single powerful principle, that American arts, the American people's creative expression and cultural innovation are powerful forces for progress because the arts enrich our lives and nourish our souls, because they transform us and replenish us, because they are a potent, dynamic engine of our economy as well. And in this way, our work, the NEA's work, is captured by former Chairman Rocco Landisman's muscular sentence, which, as we all remember, was simply, art works. Art works. So we are supporting American artwork and the visionaries who create it. We are supporting art's work, the myriad ways that art teaches, heals, renews, and connects. And we are supporting art as work, bolstering the arts economy and thus the economy through art. So before we get down to our official business, I'd like to touch briefly on all three dimensions of our efforts. First, supporting singular American art and design institutions and the performances, exhibitions, and streetscapes that they enable artists to create and share. Second, unleashing the transformational power of the arts to honor our traditions, to embolden our aspirations, and to challenge people in our communities to change. And third, recognizing and counting the contributions of America's two million full-time artists and six million arts-related workers, all of whom make our neighborhoods more livable, our cities and towns stronger, and our national economy healthier. So first a word about the state of our art. During the last five years, the Obama administration's NEA has done many things fabulously well, thanks both to the council's leadership and the tireless efforts of our talented colleagues here at the NEA. Among the most essential, we've continued to get federal dollars to all 50 states and grant checks in the mail, supporting American arts organizations, American artists, and American art in every single congressional district. Since President Obama took office, we have distributed more than 11,000 grants and almost 350 cooperative and interagency agreements. This is our bread and butter. We're proud of our work to recognize and reward excellence and merit and to serve underserved communities across the country. And we've been amazed, in fact humbled, as we've watched a new generation of American artists 
craft works of grace and beauty, works that start conversations, works that stir the heart and spark the imagination. At the same time, we have done more, much more to enhance the impact of the arts and to advance knowledge about the arts. And this is the second area where we have focused, asking how art works. How does art work to move us, teach us, and embolden us? Asking how art works to bring us together, to strengthen our bonds. And in exploring these questions, the NEA has joined with a whole host of unlikely partners in order to maximize our leverage and forge strong partnerships throughout the agency and across the entire federal government. So take our partnership with the Walter Reed National Military Medical Centers, National Intrepid Center of Excellence, which is the most advanced center for the treatment of our wounded warriors and of treatment of traumatic brain injury and the psychological health issues sometimes referred to as post-traumatic stress. This healing arts partnership explores how creative arts engagement can help wounded warriors recover, can help them to heal. For many of us, this Department of Defense partnership is one of the most gratifying efforts in which we've ever been involved. Many wounded warriors come in, hear about the program, and then they say, I don't do art. Um, I've never done art. But then when they start to participate, whether through writing or painting or music, they find out that it can be a transformational experience. Many of them are telling us that the arts are among the most helpful parts of their rehabilitation and that the arts opened a new door for them, a new door for them to understand and feel who they have become and who they want to become. So we are absolutely thrilled to announce that the NEA recently signed a memorandum of understanding to expand the healing arts program to Fort Belvoir in Virginia. We're taking that as proof of concept. Or take another Obama administration partnership between the NEA and the Department of Defense and Blue Star Families. Last year, more than 2,000 American museums opened their doors for free to all active duty military and National Guard families. Or take the amazing partnership between our Office of Research and Analysis and the Department of Health and Human Services. It's called the Arts and Human Development Task Force and it's an alliance of 18 federal agencies. You would never think that the little NEA could pull together 18 federal agencies and a task force. Uh, but this task force is supporting the development of more and better research and evidence on how the arts help people to reach their full potential throughout all stages of life, from pre-K to senior citizens. There's increasing data that participation in art making can help children in need to develop better learning schools throughout their elementary school years. And that the creation of art through music or theater can help mitigate the diseases of aging. So this is what government should do. It should connect disparate institutions in common purpose to serve the American people. And it should provide a platform to make things happen. So I talked about our support for art and our support for arts work. But let me close by talking about the arts as work, about America's arts economy. People sometimes ask rhetorically, what would happen if the arts went away tomorrow? What difference would it make? We all have some vague sense that such a thing would be terrible and, we, and that we would all be appreciably worse off if the arts went away tomorrow. But through a joint venture with the Commerce Department's prestigious Bureau of Economic Analysis, we began to use big data to answer the questions in dollar figures. Through establishing the first official arts and cultural production satellite account, or the ACPSA, to measure how, how do arts and culture boost the American economy. 
This groundbreaking effort measures for the first time the cumulative effect and impact of the arts and cultural industries on the nation's gross domestic product, or GDP. In December, the BEA released preliminary estimates of their findings. The figures, which far exceeded our expectations, show that the arts produce $504 billion worth of goods and services each year, representing 3.2% of the country's GDP. It's, it's a difficult number to grasp, especially for those of us in the arts. And we're more used to thinking of thousands or maybe millions, but not billions. But to put it in perspective, this share that the arts and cultural production productivity accounts for is a bigger share than travel and tourism. And it's even bigger than what agriculture contributes. It's bigger than the economies of most states. And so the way we best serve the American people is by using this incredible resource, one of our nation's most important natural resources and national treasures, creative talent, to strengthen our economy. One way the NEA is taking action on this recognition is through a program that we call Our Town. In all 50 states, we are supporting communities who are using art and design to revitalize and redevelop old spaces into new inviting places, thereby transforming desolate streetscapes and barren fields into thriving neighborhoods and environments. From urban exhibits to rural festivals, the results have been, in a word, wonderful. For instance, in Opelika, Florida, outside of Miami, our town is bringing in landscape architects and artists to help a local community development organization transform a set of the metal barr barricades that had isolated a struggling neighborhood, transform that into a new gateway that welcomes people into a reborn, mixed-use, mixed-income neighborhood. In rural Wisconsin, a group of artists called Worm Farm is using an Our Town grant to reimagine the roadside farm stand, working with designers and farmers to design gorgeous mobile remote culture stands, which sell nutritious local fruits and vegetables to urban visitors and create a link between rural life and culture and the arts. In both these cases, it is, it is art for expression's sake, yes, but it's also art that's improving how people live. It's art that moves the needle of economic growth at the same time. So where do we go from here? Obviously, we go forward for the American people, and because our work must be for and with and from all of the American people. Our charge is timeless, supporting excellent, meritorious art and as well serving the underserved. But here's the thing, America is changing, demographically, culturally, socially. And so we, the NEA, need to keep evolving in turn. Even as technology is changing art and culture itself, the NEA must support not only cultural expression, but also cultural innovation because the arts matter to all of us, to, to the health of our rural communities and the health of our economy, to our wounded warriors and military families, to the young and to the young at heart. So in order to sustain the arts, we need to forge new partnerships and embrace new technologies. To steward the arts, we need to make the most of our leverage, which is, it's turning out to be, our most powerful tool. And if we continue to do all these things, all these things and no fewer, then the NEA's next 49 years will be as beneficial to the country as our last 49 have been. So five years into the Obama administration, this much is safe to say. The age of President Obama will be remembered for our artists, for our cultural institutions. It will be remembered as a time when the American people stood behind their artists through the NEA, and when their artists breathed new spirit into American life. 
it will be remembered as a time when artists of every color and creed, from every community, from every corner of our country, when we all join together. And for your part, the National Council deserves to be very proud that you helped make so much of this possible. So for all of our sakes, let us continue to support artworks, the works of art, and the arts economy during the years ahead. There is much work to be done and much to be done through the power of art. So thank you all for indulging me as I talk about the great work of the agency. Thank you. Now I'd like to let you hear all hear from some of our recent grantees. I'm thrilled to welcome representatives of Second Stage Theater and the Grand Canyon Chamber Music Festival, who will present on some of their latest work. NEA Interim Director of Everything, NEA Interim Director of Performing Arts, Doug Sontag, will be introducing our guests from Second Stage. Doug. Thank you, Joan. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome our first guests. And our first presentation will focus on Second Stage Theater. Joining us at the table are Artistic Director Carol Rothman, Associate Artistic Director Christopher Burney, actor Armando Riesco, and playwright Chiara Alegria Hudas, who received the Pulitzer Prize in 2012 for her play, Water by the Spoonful. Founded in 1979 in New York, Second Stage is committed to diversity, both in terms of what it produces and who it produces. Both established and emerging playwrights, directors, designers, and actors are featured in the theater's broad range of performances, which vary from musicals and solo performances to creative interpretations of contemporary plays. We will begin the presentation with a short clip from The Happiest Song Plays Last by playwright Chiara Alegria Hudas. Thank you very much. <laughs> And um, I'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Council for 35 years of support. Um, I'm the founder and the artistic director, so I've actually been leading the theater for 35 years. And I couldn't be more honored to be here today to speak about our work with Chiara. Second Stage produces plays by living American writers. We like the fact that they're living because it lets us see and be involved in the process of creating art and engages our audiences as well. We're particularly interested in the wide variety of stories the writers tell us in the plays they write. Now, I'm from the Midwest. I grew up in Missouri. The stories I heard were from a relatively small segment of people. They were fun and fascinating and often heroic. It wasn't until I started a theater and met a wide group of artists that my eyes were open to the vast and crazy and sheer massive number of experiences that our playwrights wanted to share on our stages. And I say share because I am so grateful that I've been able to share not only with the writers, but with our audiences, young and old, these extremely well-written, perceptive, and diverse tales of America. We've produced two plays in the trilogy of plays written by Chiara. I think you'll see some slides uh, of our productions. Water by the Spoonful and The Happiest Song Plays Last. These are rich, full, insightful plays about Elliot, who is the third generation of military men in his family. Elliot served in Iraq, and we learn a lot about his experiences there and what he carried with him when he came back home. These plays are also about Eliot's cousin, Yasmin, 
and their shared upbringing in the Puerto Rican community of North Philly. Yasmin is an Ivy League educated music teacher who in the course of the plays, various plays, comes back to North Philly and opens her home to the neighborhood. And the plays are also about music. Classical in the first play, jazz in Water by the Spoonful, and traditional Puerto Rican in Happiest Song. I have to admit, I never knew what a quattro was until it was the dominating instrument that the onstage band played in Happiest Song and that Elliot returns to at the end of the play cycle. Actually, I didn't know much about serving in Iraq, being Puerto Rican in North Philly, or the be beautiful music of the quattro before Chiara brought them into my life and onto our stage. And it would be incorrect of me to say that these are the only things that these plays are about or that Chiara is writing about in these plays. So for a very first-hand description, uh, let me introduce Chiara Hudis, a gifted and unique playwright. Thank you, Carol. Our play, The Happy Song Plays Last, just closed on Sunday in New York, so this is a nice chance to live in it for another moment for me. Uh, in 2003, I wrote the following speech. A room made of cinder block. A mattress lies on a cot containing 36 springs. If you lie on the mattress, you can feel each of the 36 springs, one at a time, as you close your eyes and try to sleep the full four hours. A white sheet is on the mattress. The corners are folded and tucked under, tight like an envelope, military code. The corner of the sheet is checked at 0600 hours daily. No wrinkles or bumps allowed. A man enters. <clears throat> Those were not stage directions. Those were the first lines of dialogue in my play, Elliot, A Soldier's Fugue. The man who narrated his own entrance was Elliot, a 17-year-old, fresh out of public school, Puerto Rican American everyman who was about to ship off to Kuwait, where he would be amongst the first group of Marines to cross the border north into Iraq. When I first contemplated writing a piece about what this new conflict would mean for my generation, for an entire generation of young Americans, I started with interviews. My uncle had voluntarily enlisted during Vietnam. It was an experience he never spoke about, but boy did he open his heart to me as soon as I sat down with him and asked one simple question, what was it like? With 40 years of reflection separating him from his Marine days, he was sad, mournful, some humorous anecdotes thrown in, analytical. Then I interviewed my cousin, his son, who had returned from Iraq just a matter of weeks before the interview. Same question. So, what was it like? Again, the story is poured forth, but full of adrenaline and swagger, machismo and determination. He would repair his wounded leg. He would go back to Iraq and fight with his buddies, with his brothers. I walked the streets and imagined these two extremely different, yet somehow similar experiences side by side. Father and son. Had one learned from the other's pain? Had they even shared these stories with each other? How closely do we repeat our elders' mistakes? How directly do we inherit our elders' wounds? During one such walk, it struck me, this looks like a fugue from Johann Sebastian Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier. A musical theme, a simple melody is presented. That theme is echoed, inverted, played a third up, doubled. The story of an entire nation's armed conflict as told through Puerto Rican men as illuminated by Bach preludes and fugues. Puerto Ricans and J.S. Bach don't go together. And that's why I had to write it that way. Fast forward to 2009. The character Elliot finds himself at home in Philly after an honorable discharge and a significant leg injury. He's struggling. He can't put together the pieces. He's stuck in the impoverished neighborhood where he grew up. The future does not look so bright. In this new play, Water by the Spoonful, Elliot's cousin Yasmin gives the following lecture to her music students at Swarthmore. She says, Coltrane's A Love Supreme, 1964. Dissonance is still a gateway to resolution. A B diminished chord is still resolving to C major. A tritone is still resolving up to 
class, the major sixth. Diminished chords, tritones, still didn't have the right to be their own independent thought. In 1965, something changed. The ugliness bore no promise of a happy ending. The ugliness became an end in itself. Coltrane democratized the notes. He said, they're all equal. Freedom. It was called free jazz, but freedom is a hard thing to express musically without spinning into noise. So it seems this notion of putting Eliot's story in a frame where things don't go together, it seems I'd taken this notion to a logical extreme. A play about a Puerto Rican veteran of the Iraq War, his Ivy League educated cousin, and a chat room full of recovering addicts from around the world. Eliot, the character, um, was using um, pain meds on his leg and was stuck. Here into this domestic drama about a Puerto Rican family stepped a Japanese orphan, an African-American middle-aged IRS paper pusher, a new money tech mogul who lived on Philly's wealthy main line, all sharing one stage, one story, set to the transcendent, challenging notes of Coltrane's jazz. Why should all these things be contained within one story? I knew I was being rebellious. I knew I was pushing a few comfort zones. And yet, my multitudes, the multitudes within me, do not go together. I do not go with myself. So it felt like there was some sort of truth in assembling these disparate elements and seeing what happened in the spaces between them. It was a thought experiment, one that reflected in my heart our American experiment. By 2011, it seems I finally learned my lesson. I chose Musica Hibara, Puerto Rican folk music from the Verdant Island Mountains as my musical frame. Familiar, comforting, nostalgic, poetic, syncopated, part African percussion, part European parlor. This was the music and lyrics of Puerto Rico. I set the play in North Philly, the Puerto Rican part of town. Finally, a bit of cohesion putting the characters in the places where they belong, working within the framework of how we define each other in contemporary Amer identity politics. Eliot was beginning to put the pieces together. He was beginning to choose and control his life as a man. His North Philly community needed him desperately. A local musician and guidance counselor had just died in a completely preventable, neglectful manner in a dilapidated local emergency room. This was based on a real life story of my friend and neighbor from Philadelphia. This community needed Elliot to come and join their protests. Why then did the character of Elliot find himself far away from the people who needed him back in the Middle East in this play? This time he wasn't a Marine. This time he was a special consultant on a Hollywood movie about the Iraq war. On set, Elliot befriended an Iraqi refugee from Jordan who was working as a crew member. And things took off in their relationship when just two countries over, the Egyptian revolution unfolded. Once it was announced that Mubarak had resigned, Elliot became determined on their day off to make his way to Egypt. As they debate whether or not it's safe or even possible to go, an actor from the film expresses her reticence. She says, people died there. Those protesters haven't slept. They've prayed as bullets flew. They held hands to protect each other's prayers. They shouted things their parents were terrified to whisper. I don't get to waltz in and claim that. Elliot counters, Egypt invented pyramids. They made algebra, and now they took down a dictator with Sharpie pens and Twitter. I want to be the only Puerto Rican up in there. So in this play, Elliot grows up. He becomes a man. I returned to his musical roots, his essence, the sounds of his childhood. But he had already left the nest of easy identification. His feet and heart were too restless. He took his music with him as he became a citizen of the world. In the final scene of this three-play cycle, Elliot does return to Philly, and he inherits the cuatro, the Puerto Rican guitar, that this deceased local musician left behind gone unplayed for a year. And he holds it, and as he holds the squatro, those Bach preludes and fugues are in his heart. That jazz, that John Coltrane is in his heart. But the final notes he plays are 
he just plucks out a folkloric melody, just a few tunes, a few notes from his childhood. And he says, just like a kid, right? He's brought his world home. All that world in his song, he's brought it home. Thank you. My name is Chris Burney, and I'm the Associate Artistic Director of Second Stage Theater and the curator of 2ST Uptown. Thank you to the NEA and National Council on the Arts for inviting us to speak about the unique experience we've had working with Chiara and the many communities this work has reached. Second Stage had the opportunity to produce both Water by the Spoonful and The Happiest Song Plays Last in consecutive seasons. Maintaining that consistency of programming provided unique opportunities to engage with the cross-section of Latino communities in New York City and build our institution's relationship among many diverse audiences. Now, there are too many stories to relate, so I'll just share a few examples of these partnerships. We held a special event at the theater in conjunction with OLA, the Hispanic Organization of Latin Actors, that included a panel discussion with the cast. We built a unique marketing partnership with Soy AARP, which led to a special evening with their members and Kiara at the theater. My favorite event, though, by far, was on the first day of rehearsal for Happiest Song. Just as Yaz does in the play, we held a paranda. It's a party that happens around the holiday season, and we had it on the stage at second stage. We had amazing Puerto Rican food, a full Planeros band, and we invited community leaders. It was an opportunity for community members, the cast, and creative team to come together as a family to celebrate the culture and stories in Kiara's play. The theater was packed, and the stage was filled with everyone aged 8 to 80 dancing together. Second Stage also has a long-standing program offering free student matinees that serve public schools from neighborhoods throughout New York City. The schools we partner with have diverse student populations that are, on average, 52% Hispanic or Latino and 21% African American. Seeing the two plays from this cycle enabled students to gain an ongoing, meaningful relationship with both characters and their stories. Let me share a quote from one of these students. This is from Angie, who's a high school student at Aviation High School in Brooklyn. The pride in your heritage is seen in this play and I can relate because I'm proud of where I came from. I remember the music because, though I may not be from Puerto Rico, I hear this music around my neighborhood and really appreciate it. The idea of knowing your ethnicity and embracing it will be something I'll definitely take with me. This will affect me by really embracing my origins. Angie's thoughts embrace the power of Kiara's work. There's one more community I have to mention the incredible community of actors who have brought Kiara's worlds to vivid life. And of course, to talk about actors and this cycle of plays, there is one who immediately stands out. Please welcome the brilliant, dedicated actor who has portrayed Elliot in all three plays, Armando Riesco. Hello. Thank you for having us. Uh, so yeah, I am I'm actually Armando Riesco, don't let the red hair fool you. Uh, I, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I came to the mainland uh, some 18 years ago with the, with the dream to become an actor. Uh, I've been told that if you can't dream it, you know, if you can't visualize it, then it can't come true. Right? There's a line uh, in the play that's about the secret, you know that book? that all artists have probably read at some point, where you've got to manifest it in order to, to see it. Luckily for me, I've had a, a few experiences that have proved that theory false. Uh, when I met my wife 12 years ago, I remember thinking, there's, there's no way I could have dreamed this woman up. This is much better than, than I thought. Uh, and she's still proving that true. And as an actor, I never dreamed that I could one day play a lead Latino role, a role with the depth of a Hamlet and the, the funny of a Richard Pryor. 
Uh, I never dreamed that I would play it in three different plays in three different cities. And I definitely never dreamed that at the center of this Pulitzer Prize winning thing would be my homeland of Puerto Rico. It's music, it's traditions, it's fried foods and accompanying food comas. Uh, basically, my heart. Uh, one of the main reasons I could have never imagined this is because I'd never seen anything like it. And to me, if I hadn't seen it, you know, it didn't exist. So I mean, I'd seen Puerto Ricans before on screen, but they were gingerly sashaying with switchblades in their hands. I'm here to tell you that's not how a gang fight goes down in Puerto Rico. Uh, we generally twirl. Uh, Elliot is, is a Puerto Rican character at the center of an American story. It's a character very much based on a real person who goes to war, who sheds blood, both the enemies and his own, in the name of freedom, who battles addiction, who falls in love. Who's, he starts the trilogy as a child and he ends up a man, which is an evolution that, that I experienced simultaneously as, as the actor playing the role over seven years. Uh, when we, when we started with the first installment in a basement on Bleecker Street, Elliot was this dapper, kind of self-assured, full of swagger young guy, much like I was in 2006. Uh, and by the end of the trilogy, Elliot emerges as a man who's self-aware, who's accepting of his flaws and lack of definitive answers to life's big questions. And he's hopeful for the future. He's got a child on the way, and a new role as a father coming up just like I have a child on the way now. And I'm self-aware that I have no idea how to change a diaper. Uh, but I'm hopeful you know, that I can Google it and figure it out. So wish me luck. Uh, one of the biggest thrills of these last seven years has been seeing these young Latino audience members come in. Kids just like me 18 years ago, they're coming to see these plays at this at all these important American venues, you know, the Goodman Theater in Chicago, second stage smack in the middle of Manhattan. These young Latino kids saw their own stories come to life. And uh, kids from our communities were cheering and laughing and crying and texting sometimes. We won't get into that. Uh, but I, I knew that something inside them was lit. It was a joy for all the cast to, to experience and witness that, that awakening firsthand. Now, parts of these stories may seem foreign to certain audience members, but they were the everyday experiences of these kids. You know, their corners, their lingo, uh, the way they talk, the, the stories that their parents tell them at the dinner table, the essence of where they come from. And when you see something like that on the stage or on a screen, or you hear it on the radio, like all of a sudden you matter. It's not a feeling or experience that should be taken for granted. I remember when I was 19 and I started studying Latin American films and for the first time in my life I saw people speaking my mother tongue uh, in stories sometimes dramatic, sometimes mundane and realizing that without knowing it I'd been, for 19 years, I'd been silently oppressed. Despite being educated at the best Jesuit schools and going to Northwestern University I never realized that I'd never seen myself or my people on screen. We were present, but definitely not, not in any way that seemed to reflect the reality around me. You know, we were in some way invisible. I mean, I love the three amigos, but I don't know anyone who terrorizes small villages in Mexico. You know. In the last seven years, I feel proud to have been a part of a project that's the complete opposite. It, it, it says we're here. We matter. We're an essential part of the fabric of society. We're crucial. We're just like the English and the Dutch and the Africans that came over in the 17th century. We're just like the Germans and the Jews and the Irish that came in the 19th century. We're here to seek our dreams and to join all these other groups that have done the same before us. We're an integral part of the United States of America. We're at the center. So thank you to Second Stage for, for producing these plays. Thank you to the NEA for, for supporting our efforts. Uh, I'm done with the trilogy <laughs> after seven years, finally. I hope the plays get done all over the nation. 
and that other Latino actors get to have similar experiences to mine. I hope they grow and relish in the opportunity to play this wonderful, deep, flawed, amazing character. And I hope that this door opening, that this, this unimagined, undreamable dream of mine that came true means that more playwrights and more theaters and more plays start treating us like what we are, which is equals. Thank you very much. Wow. So thank you so much, Carol, Chris, Chiara, and Armando. Uh, now I'd like to ask the members of the council whether they have any questions or comments for second stage. Yes, we do. First of all, let me say congratulations on several levels. Um, you know, we think about us in America as being very different than the rest of the world. I really hate the term citizens of the world. And I like the feeling of America being one place. But you have so described, Kira, with your plays, you do so, so describe the, um, the metamorphosis that takes place. And through Armando's great acting and, uh, and persistence in seven years, that's, that's an amazing, you know, to stay with it that long and, and become part of that fiber. You describe what happens to those immigrants who come here and say, I want to be part of what America is. That, that just happens to be the Puerto Rican culture or, the, or it could have been, you know, an American Indian. It could be you know, somebody from another planet. I mean, we, when we become an American and, and, and you look at the red, white, and blue and you say, it's worth dying for. I'm sure there have been other countries that have felt that way, their citizens have felt that way as well. But we are so unique, we are so different and through the artistic expression that you have gained the Nobel Prize for. And let me tell you, it, it, it certainly is deserving uh, how you express yourself through not just Philadelphia, but but as you expand and and take in the military cross section of all walks of life, and the and the and the terrible uh, thing of war, and how the soldier goes through this and becomes wounded as well, and then grows up internally. You describe the entire story of every one of us, all of us as Americans, whether we were born here or not and how we begin to respect our country, re respect the people who are immigrants and become part of our fiber, and how we all work to the same end, the same goal, and that's being a responsible citizen. And through your art, you have described that so eloquently. And we are proud here at the NEA to have supported this process. And uh, congratulations on your new child coming. Thank you. Thank you, Lee Greenwood. Uh, I had a, Joan, I had a Dave, question. Yes. Uh, the play Mom. is a lot about identity and home. What's the challenge of putting on a play, writing a play, acting in a play, where you have diverse audiences? For some, this is their exposure to this identity and home. And at the same time, you have audiences where they already know and feel this identity and home. Uh, so I guess it's a question, how do you grapple with that kind of level of authenticity? Um, I think this is going to be an ongoing question of my career as I continue to write. And, um, you know, the play, we, we focus a little bit on some of the identity things involved with the play, but of course the, the plays are about so much more too. In some ways those are just the facts of the play and out of those facts the story emerges. Um, I think that the question about audience is for me as a writer, two sides of a coin, and it's just not complete without either. In some ways, my ideal audience member is that high school student who says, oh, they, they, from the first line of dialogue, they get it. They know what these facts are, they know what these circumstances are. It's familiar, it's like breathing to them. And I love that, and they get to sit there, and then, then they're not, there's not a process of familiarization. They know it, so they're just with the story. 
So in some ways, that's my ideal audience member. A lot of times these people, it's their first play they've ever been to, which is special and wonderful for me. I, I, it's like I feel like I'm proselytizing, you know, and uh, that they think, oh, that's how it's supposed to be, which is really nice. In another sense, I think what theater does so well and why I choose it every day as an art form when I wake up and sit at my writing desk is um, that it takes you to places you have n living rooms you have never stepped foot in. You're hearing language used in a way you've never used it. And yet they're still just human beings on stage. And so someone to whom there is just no familiarity is also to me my ideal audience member. And if I just had one and just had the other, it would feel imbalanced. It wouldn't feel like a rich enough experience. And so in some ways, the, the, the most wonderful audiences for this play were the times when those two people were sitting right next to each other. You know, a matinee where subscribers would come and might not have seen this particular set of people, might not have heard these particular notes of music played in that way before, sitting right next to the, the student who's there with their school group really getting it from the first moment. Um, that's, my, that's what I think is the best potential audience for American theater and what I hope that, you know, my, my plays and other plays like mine and theaters that are brave enough to take the risk on plays like mine, um, you know, I hope we can engender an audience like that going forward. Yes. Kiara, I want to say again, thank you uh, for this, um, for really telling the stories of, of uh, the Latino diaspora here in the United States, but also stories that every one of us can relate to. Um, and, you know, thank you, Armando, for, you know, t uh, being so creative and so able to, to really express that on stage. And I also want to thank Second Stage Theater. You you know, Carol and Chris, for crossing those boundaries, for saying, we're going to take that risk. There is a broader world out there, and we're going to let that other voice come through. Uh, and I thank you for that and for letting diverse audiences and diverse stories come together and say, this is what American culture is. So thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Maria. A quick question for Carol. Do you yes, feel, Mas. as a theater, you're being brave by doing these plays? Um, <clears throat> well, that's a tough question. I don't actually feel I'm being brave. I, I think that that's what theater should be doing. And I'm more excited than brave to hear different stories. Um, I think you could talk to my board of trustees and some of them might say that I was being brave to, <laughs> to, to do, do these kinds of plays. But from my feeling is if we're not going to create a new audience for theater, then we're just not going to be able to exist. And I think we really have to look at what is in our culture and the kinds of people that live in New York City and appeal to everybody. And when Kiara was talking about how some of the people don't understand what's going on, literally in in Water by the Spoonful, there's a whole series of, of uh, conversations via the internet. So there were a whole group of people that had no idea what was going on on stage. And they yet would stay and say, oh, this is the new world. This is what I, I, you know, I want to be part of. And so I think Second Stage encourages, oh, this is going to sound really well, anyway, I think Second Stage encourages audiences that want to take risks and that don't expect the same thing every time they walk into the theater. So I think we're really, that's a long-term, 35-year uh, goal of ours is to really diversify the audience, to get the young people in, and to get in all kinds of people that will then sit next to each other as Kiara said, and influence and be part of um, a whole different community. So it's not brave, it's just what we do. Joan, Israelite. Yes, I'm curious, what are you doing next? Okay, so um, 
Because we've been very interested in this particular Latino audience, uh, one of the shows that we're doing over the summer is by a young, younger, but not, not as well known um, playwright. I'm gonna let Chris talk about that. Um, it's her first major production in New York. It's a play called Mala Erba by Tanya Saracho. She's been produced in Chicago, um, but it's a very interesting story about four Latina women on the border in Texas and uh, the conflicts they have between their personal loves and obligations to their families. So that's a part of a way that we're trying to continue our connection with these different audiences, but also bring our core subscriber audiences along in telling these different stories. Thank you. Other questions? All right. So uh, thank you so much. Our next group of presenters will be introduced by NEA. So our next group of presenters will be introduced by NEA Director of Arts Education, Ayanna Hudson. Ayanna. Thank you, Joan. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Claire Hoffman, Russell Goodluck, and Celeste Lansing, who are here to discuss the Grand Canyon Chamber Music Festival's Native American Composer Apprenticeship Project, or NACAP, which received a National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Award in 2011. Launched in 2000, NACAP encourages the musical aspirations of middle and high school students living on Hopi and Navajo reservations in both Utah and Arizona. Through one-on-one -on -one work with native composers, students learn how to compose music for string quartet. This three-week program culminates in the premiere of students' compositions by professional musicians at the festival itself. I'm going to turn it over to Claire. I'm going to play your little film first before we start. This is absolutely the NACAP national anthem. Here we go. This is called Possessed by Obscurity. Rodney Yazzie. <laughs>
Um, hopefully this, okay, good. Um, NACAP alum and current assistant composer in residence, Michael Begay, has relayed to us that when he tells people he's a composer, they often respond, I didn't know natives composed. I'm here to tell you, they do. We've been bringing musicians to rural communities in the Southwest, primarily on the Navajo and Hopi Nations, since 1984. At the beginning, we felt kind of like Brigadoon, showing up once a year, playing our music and leaving, probably leaving people scratching their heads, wondering what was that all about. We were looking for a way to have more of an impact, not just on our students and communities, but on ourselves as well. And we've been playing with the idea of a composer residency for some time, when in 2000, we had the serendipitous coming together of the right people at the right time. Uh, composer Brent Michael Davids, a member of the Mohican Nation, joined us as composer in residence that year. He had just come off a composer residency in Minnesota where he taught school students composition. And he said to us, I've always wanted to do something like that with native students. Enough said. <laughs> um, the following year, 2001, we launched NACAP. We had three partner schools and five students. One of those students was Michael Begay. Michael is a smart, articulate, talented young man. He was what they called a super senior. High school just wasn't doing it for him. He said to us, oh, can I go back? I want this one. Monument Valley, Navajo Nation. He said, I come from a land that is beautiful and always shimmering with broken dreams, broken bottles. NACAP gave me discipline, not just in writing music, overall. It opened my mind to art and how powerful art is. Serving some of the most rural and underserved reservation communities, NACAP engages students in a rigorous study of composition. They study with professional musicians and composers. They traverse the entire composer's experience from inspiration to notation, workshop, performance, and recording of their own original works. But first, you have to learn the language. Time signature, key signature, staffs, clefs, arco, legato, coleño, this is our head composer in residence, Raven Chacon, working with one of our students. I believe this was a couple of years ago at Whitehorse High School. Here he is working with students at Chinle High School and again at Monument Valley High School, which is on the Navajo Nation in Utah. There was a Rand Corporation study a few years ago that said maximum arts involvement effects on young people come from direct involvement in the performing arts. NACAP students have the most direct involvement in the performing arts. They are the creators of the music that is studied, rehearsed, presented, and recorded. They are afforded the same respect that the professional composers and musicians with whom they share the stage are. Here we are. Okay, you've learned the language. Now you've got to get your ideas down on paper. Jazz Jamat at Whitehorse High School. O.C. Red, Redbird, is that her last name? O.C. Redbird at Monument Valley High School. And Celeste Lansing, review, review, rewrite, rewrite constantly. It's, it's an arduous process, anyone who's ever written anything. Um, we mentioned that this is primarily on the Navajo and Hopi Reservation. Uh, we have also worked with students at the Salt River Pima Maricopa community, which is outside of Phoenix. Um, this is one of our first year students last year, Isabella Dougherty. And uh, one of the most exciting things in NACAB is when the students hear their pieces performed by live professional musicians for the first time, and their reactions are just, oh my god, I can't believe I, I wrote that. Um, and Isabella was wonderful last year because she was just listening to the string quartet play her piece. Oh, this is so exciting, this is wonderful. But you played a wrong note. <laughs> F sharp, she tells them. Uh, and here, here is that process. This is at Monument Valley High School. And I love this series of photos because it shows you how involved the students are and they know exactly what they want and they tell us. Here's Lorenzo Max at uh, Gray Hills Academy. <laughs> He's telling Dorothy how to play his piece. It is his music, it is their music. Here's uh, 
Greg Cortez, also Gray Hills Academy, uh, showing uh, violist Ralph Ferris exactly how he wants his piece played on the viola. Um, and again, the young man I was talking to you about earlier, Michael Begay, uh, he is now our, one of our assistant composers in residence, and here he is working with the ensemble Ethel, one of our string quartets in residence, uh, with the students at Tuba City High School. This is actually a Chinle Unified School District school bus. One of our biggest challenges is geography. NACAP students often live very far from their schools, have very long commutes to and from school, and significant after-school family obligations, everything from herding sheep to helping out with younger siblings and, and elderly grandparents. By bringing the musicians and the teachers to the schools, we overcome one of the biggest hurdles for these students, and that is very simply access. Again, more workshopping. This is at Chinle High School. Whitehorse High School, concert tonight at 6.30, don't miss it. <laughs> and this is also Whitehorse High School in Utah. They have a Hogan. I think every high school should have a Hogan in their parking lot. Uh, revisions are being made up until the 11th hour. And who here has written a string quartet? I know my two students have. OK, who has written a piece for a symphonic band? Last year, Whitehorse High School student Nijoni Spencer wrote a piece for string quartet and symphonic band, and here they are uh, rehearsing it. An amazing undertaking, uh, really. Showing her Navajo pride. <laughs> and this is our student, Celeste Lansing, is here today. She'll be speaking to you in a moment. This is uh, the first page of a score that she wrote a few years ago, Few So Lucky for John and Florence. Um, if, if you would like to later ask her about the meaning of that title, it's such a beautiful piece and, and such a beautiful title. Another one of our schools, Monument Valley High School. And here is our student, Russell Goodluck. He'll be joining us. He'll be speaking in a few minutes, performing with uh, Ethel at the Tempe History Museum. We've had the opportunity to bring these students' music uh, throughout the world. It's been performed in Australia, I believe in Japan, in, uh, in Holland and throughout the United States. And here are our composers in residence. On the right, the young man Michael Begay, I told you about, is on the right, and our head composer in residence, Raven Chacon. Raven is a member of the Navajo Nation, one of the few native composers out there today working. We are so honored to have him as our composer in residence. That is the Grand Canyon in the background. It's not a painting. That's the Grand Canyon. Uh, NACAP culminates with the world premiere performance at the Grand Canyon Music Festival. Um, what we like to say at, at all of our programs, and especially at our school programs, is there aren't enough Native American musicians in the American music mix. NACAP gives these students a voice, and it's a voice we all need to listen to. Here we have another student composer working with members of the um, Catalyst Quartet, Chris Jenkins and uh, uh, Jesse Montgomery, this is just prior to the concert. Again, the revisions are going on right up until the 11th hour. This is the first page of Russell Goodluck's piece from last year. Uh, he was at uh, Mesa Community College, but continuing to write music for it. And NACAP, class of 2013. <laughs> um, I like what, what Raven Chacon has said. Uh, he said, NACAP is what Tuba City sounds like. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I am the daughter of a New York City subway track worker. When I was uh, in high school, a 35 cent token, now you know how old I am, a 35 cent token could get me to Carnegie Hall in 30 minutes, Lincoln Center in 45, and I was there. I spent many, many uh, <laughs> afternoons wandering the halls of, of Lincoln Center and State Theater. Um, it never occurred to me for a minute that I didn't have every right to be there. National Endowment for the Arts funding of NACAP is that 35 cent token for our students? We could not do this in these rural, underserved communities without the support of the National Endowment for the Arts. It addresses the single greatest obstacle to these students, lack of access. I thank you so much, so much for inviting us, so much for listening to our story. And the real stars of NACAP are our students. So I would like to introduce to you our students. Uh, first up will be uh, Celeste Lansing. She is, as I said earlier, was a, is a graduate of Whitehorse High School. 
uh, from Montezuma Creek, Utah, Navajo Nation, currently a freshman in college. And uh, she came on board with us last year. I think this was actually her second year uh, as an assistant to Raven Chacon. And her other student is uh, Russell Goodluck. Russell is from Chinle, Arizona on the Navajo uh, Nation and uh, finished two years at Mesa Community College. And in the fall, he'll be beginning studies at uh, Fort Lewis College. And he wants to continue with his studies of music. Um, actually, he, had, uh, he was invited to the Moab Music Festival a couple of years ago. He can tell you a little bit more about that. Thank you again so much. It, this means so much to us. And Celeste. Yat a she a slash slancing in she, clash chit in slin, quizzes lana bashachin, tabahan to shiche, but ani de chanella, shima doja je a Marie do Lester Lansing, shima sana doja che a Florence do John Norton, shima sana or chanellas dean do chanellas don a Betty do Roger um, Lansing in she. Um, hello, my name is Celeste Lansing. Um, how I just introduced myself is formally how I introduced myself in Navajo. Um, I am a graduate of Whitehorse High School. I'm studying microbiology now. I'm a pre-med student over at Utah State University. Um, I would like to share you a story about how I came to NECAP. When I was in seventh grade, I was, going, I was attending a middle school in Blanding, Utah. It's called Alba R. Lyman. And then my eighth grade year, I decided to transfer to Whitehorse, which is an hour away from Blanding, and it's on the reservation. So I went from a non-reservation school to a reservation school. And it was a totally different change. It was kind of like a cultural shock for me. Because I went from being the only Native American in my honors class to going to other honors classes down in Whitehorse with other Native Americans. So it was very comforting. and. I'm very involved in my school and very active. You know, I'm on the student council. I, I play sports, and I try to do anything I can to be part of the school and, you know, show my school spirit. And I guess Ms. Schaefer, the band teacher, found me, and she asked me to part, be part of her music program in eighth grade, and I never picked up an instrument. You know, I was just like, no. And so I tried it. I tried the um, clarinet at first, and then... You know, I barely broke that thing in half because I was like, this is like, this is hard, you know, like learning all the articulations, your mouth posture and everything. And I finally got a hold of it. And I was practicing about two hours a day. And then in ninth grade, Ms. Schaefer asked me again if I could, if I could be part of a higher band, band three, which is the highest band in our high school. And along with that, she asked me to do NACAP. And I knew NACAP because my niece, she was kind of like, do you guys know who Michael Jordan is? Kind of like icon for basketball. Nijoni was the icon for music for me because she could do anything. I mean, she played the violin, oboe, and she played the clarinet too. And I was just like, I am, I'm not like her, you know. I can't compose music. That's like a next level for me. And she's like, come on. Like She encouraged me, and I was like, okay. And so I did an ACAP, and we only had a week to prepare. And I was just like, are you kidding me? I can't write, a, what, eight pages in a week? But I did it. And the interesting thing about NACAP is what it taught me is that it helped me gain a skill I never learned, like I never had before. And I'm very proud of that now because it's a part of who I am. And after I heard my first piece played at the Grand Canyon Music Festival, you know, there's a saying in Apo called a yo a bahojo, which means a yo means very. And bahojo means like, it feels really great or good or refreshing. And so after I heard my piece play, you know, every time I, like, speak or anything, I go, it makes me feel a yo bahojo. So I'm very proud to be part of this program. You know, it's brought so much, and I've been doing it. I graduated last year, and then they asked me to be a student in resident for Raven Jacone, and I did that, and I wrote another piece. But instead of doing a graphic comp or doing a... A regular, com um, a regular piece. I did a graphic composition. It's where you use pictures instead of writing down notes, which is very good. You know, this they, the good thing about NACAP is that they expand, and then they, you just don't have to, just write music. You can sing. You can write a poem. You know, I've heard that. You know, they're really welcoming with anything that they have, which is really great. And I'm very proud to be part of it. 
And I'd just like to thank you guys for a program or for funding it, because if for that, I probably would never, you know, found myself. And it's very comforting. So thank you. And now I would like to welcome Russell Goodluck. Yate Abene Russell Goodluck. Good morning, my name is Russell Goodluck. I come from Chinle, Arizona. I'm residing in Phoenix, Arizona right now. Uh, when I started NACAP, I was at the age of 16. I'm 21 right now. And uh, it just brought so much to me. At first, when I started band, I really didn't want to learn music at all. I was just there for the credit, extra elective credit. And it was that or gym, so I picked band. <laughs> At first, I wasn't really interested. I wanted to be a percussionist, but the music teacher said, nope, there's way too many percussionists. You've got to pick a wind instrument. So my instrument was saxophone, and I still play it to this day. At first, um, I've, I saw NACAP when I saw a, a string quartet perform at assembly. And when I first saw them and heard them play, I thought these were compositions by other composers out of res residency. Until uh, the, perform the composers, they came up and they introduced themselves and they showed, them, uh, showed us their works. I was just blown away. I said, I, I would really like to do that. And ever since then, I've been learning about music theory. It's been pushing me, thriving me, making me practice every single day. And to this day, I've composed over about 46 songs. And I've been invited to music festivals for them to play my music. And I've been invited to be a guest artist at them as well. NACAP has helped me so much. It has made me grown as a person. It helped me through the worst times in my life, especially after high school. And I still study in music. I've been playing for I've been playing piano for about three years now, and I've been uh, I've been granted a full scholarship at Fort Lewis for piano performance. And in Mesa Community College, I've been. I've been working by myself, practicing, learning all these other instruments, been taking all these methods classes, and it's been helping me compose music much quicker. And the people and the connections I've been make, I made with uh, Ethel and uh, the other festivals I've been to have been really helping me along this journey. And last year, I've been I've been here in D.C. with uh, the NAFO Nation Band. We've been honored to be been playing at the, the inaugural parade for Barack Obama himself. <clears throat> and I've been really excited. I've been really looking forward to come, coming back here and sharing my stories with you. And I would like to say thank you so much for giving NACAP the chance it needed and helping Native Americans all over the re reservation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Now I'd like to open the floor to council members for any comments or questions. Mas. Uh, first of all, um, Salise, this was very refreshing. So thank you very much. And thank you, Claire. I had a question for the two students. What did your families think about this program? When I told my mom, she's like, what? Because <laughs> she knew, because my, my niece, Najoni, the one I was talking about, she did it. And uh, there's eight kids in my family. I'm the youngest of eight. And then Najoni is the, is the do first daughter of my oldest sister, Olivia. And so we kind of had a broad perspective. But when, she, when I was like, yeah, they want me to try it. And so I did it. And then what her reaction was, and after I showed her the piece and everything, because she knew, you know, even because they give you like eight hours or six hours in the day to to get to prepare your music 
that's in school, but then I was working outside of that because it was my first time and I wanted it to sound cool. And then, but yeah, she was really proud of me. You know, she was like, wow, they actually came down all the way from New York, you know, you know, just to work with Native Americans, just, just that. She's like, you, she's like, you should feel very proud because a, a lot of the kids, like, especially when you're like 14 or 15, when you're a freshman, you don't get to say, you know, I composed for a quartet and they played it, you know, a, a, a name quartet like Ethel. So it was really great. I wanted to say, oh, oh Russell, go ahead. Uh, for me, it was um, kind of really unexpected because um, my, f my mother and my father were musicians. And they noticed that when I was little, I used to listen to a lot of uh, Chopin, Mozart, and Beethoven on the keyboard. And they always knew that I would be the musical child <laughs> of the children, youngest out of eight. And um, they noticed that I would be working long nights, weekends, even weekdays, staying up until 12 at night, working on music, making sure it's what I actually do here in my head. And yeah. Fabulous. Barbara, did you want to? Um, thank thank. I wanted to thank all of you, and it's such a great example of the little seed that was planted with that um, 35 cent token that I remember. Um, and then the, the fruits are amazing. Thank you. Great presentation. Do we have any other questions? Comments, Maria? So last, uh, what does that title, If You So Lucky, mean? Oh, um, I wrote a piece. I've written five pieces, actually, and Few So Lucky was actually my first piece that I really got, um, I guess, opened up, because I'm a very, I'm very shy with my life, like very personal with my personal life, you know, and so I've never found, if you've ever heard my recent pieces, they're very crazy, you guys know who Tim Burton is? Yeah, I'm, my music is based upon that and like Metallica, you know, the hardcore stuff. <laughs> If you you can actually go online and Pink Thunder if you want a taste of Celeste, just put that in YouTube because uh, they played it for the Chatter Chatter Ensemble in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So if you want to see what that what my what my base like my origin is, then you can check it out. But Few So Lucky was one of the first was the first 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 piece and only piece so far that is very moving. The I finally found that one thing that really moved me, which was my grandma and grandpa, um, Florence and John. They've been married for 89 years. My grandma got married when she was 13 to my grandpa, and he, he recently passed, but then that was for them. And so the title for you so lucky, because you, you don't really hear a lot of um, stories about, your, especially your grandparents being married for that long. I mean, if I was married at 13, oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so that piece was for them. Uh, uh, your stories are so inspiring, and I, I want to wish you all the best, and I hope you keep, keep up your work and, and keep doing this for many, many years to come. And I have to share that my grandmother got married when she was seven. I beat you to it. It's beautiful. It's just wonderful, heartwarming stories, and... Wish you all the best. Thank you. Lee. I have a musical question for both of you. Um, do you also play a musical instrument besides a clarinet? Yeah, I play the clarinet. And then that was my first year. And then second year, I moved to bass and third. And then I specialize in the contrabass clarinet. So the question is for both of you, you hear the melodies in your head. Um, when I write, sometimes I relate to the instruments I play, either the piano or the wind instruments as well, saxophones are mo mostly what I play. So do you have to, can you play them as you write them or you just hear the music and, and ask other people to play them? And can you play the music you have written on your own instruments? I've actually gone far with this. Um, I look for uh, instruments that are being donated from schools, and I go to the auctions and I get buy them. And I actually, I have two jobs right now, and I'm trying to save up for my own personal instruments. But on my spare time that I have, with the money that I have, I usually purchase, like, I just recently purchased a cello. I'm learning how to 
play it. And there's a lot of lots of lots of um, preludes and sermons that I've been thinking of writing for a very long time for a, a cellist player in Ethel. And the melodies come out actually kind of accurate, but I make sure to play them on piano first. I've learned about over 16 instruments, and I've been learning how to uh, figure out their tricks and nicks with them. So it'll be more playable for the performers. For me, um, what inspires my music is stuff that's around me, you know, all around my way, like the trees moving. You know, when I first wrote my piece, you know, I had it. I had a, it's kind, of, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like something in your head. It's like a song that you can't get out of your head. And for me, it was kind of like lightning or thundering. And so I called it Pink Thunder. And so I go off of that, or I never use my own instrument because they're always in the repair shop. They don't come back until the 1st of August. And so, <laughs> and they get cleaned there too. And so this is taken during the summer. And so the only thing I had available was a violin that was at a tune and a piano. And so I had a, so I had like a piano chart and stuff. And that's when the, that's when Raven came into handy and my music teacher, Ms. Schaefer, because they would help me with the rhythms and how to do this and how, because I wasn't familiar with, because all the notes are different on the cello, violin, and viola. And so I had, so they helped me on that, like different octaves and what goes good with what. But yeah, it was, it's, it's, it was a challenge, but I got through. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Olga. So congratulations on your individual and personal successes, but also to NACAP, which has been around 10 years. And so my question to you is, um, has the support from the NEA helped leverage other support, and what is the greatest challenge you have in sustaining your program, if any? Yes, uh, definitely. As I said before, NEA funding definitely helps us leverage other funding. You know, as you could see, and as I was trying to relate to you, these really are very, very rural communities. I'll tell you a story. Years ago, um, I was at a conference that the Arizona Commission on the Arts was giving, and they had one panel in particular that was uh, funding in rural communities. And I said, oh, I have to go to that. And they had a couple of people from major corporations in Arizona, and there was another uh, person there asking the question, you know, I have a theater company in this very rural community. What do you suggest we do? And she said, well, you know, you go to the local bank. And she said, no, this is a rural, co rural community. There is no local bank. Well, then you go to the local this or the local. No, you don't understand. This is a rural, rural community. There is nothing. And the woman from the corporation actually said to her, then why are you doing this there? Oh. And it was, it, it, this, it was just so shocking to me. I thought, well, the panel is supposed to be funding in rural communities. <laughs> and, you know, why are you doing it? And, and the woman with the theater company just said, because we are. That's where we are. That's the community we're working in. And so we do have, and, and I'll tell you one other story. One of our founding uh, uh, board members back in 1983 we told him we were interested in doing, you know, outreach and specifically to our neighbors, the Navajo Hopi reservations, and you know, Tuba cities, an hour away from the Grand Canyon. He said, and this is a direct quote, um, everybody loves the Indians, nobody wants to do anything for them. And, you know, I don't think we have to do anything for them. I think natives are perfectly capable of doing a heck of a lot. <laughs> uh, but the point is well taken. Uh, you know, we've had time and time and time again, funders and corporations and whatnot, oh, they just love what we're doing. But, you know, we don't have a stake in that community. We're not there, you know, and funders give in their own backyards. And th that's a problem. That is why we are so uh, reliant, for good or bad, on the National Endowment for the Arts and also the Arizona Commission on the Arts, the government funding is really essential to us. We are, I think, uh, the fact that we are now in our 10th season and the fact that we were, received the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Award, um, I think that is definitely giving us a certain cachet and uh, broadening uh, some possibilities for us. So um, I guess the answer to your question, the NEA funding is extremely important. And yes, we are, I think, now at this point, we have enough of a track record that we are we are now being able to leverage it more and more. Yeah. Thank you. Other comments? Lee? Did you, okay. 
So uh, my final piece of business is to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications and guidelines presented to them, and a tally of the council members' ballots reveals that all recommendations for funding and rejections have passed. So are there any additional comments or questions or discussions from council members before we wrap this up? All right. So I would like to thank the entire NEA staff for all of the hard work that went into preparing for this council meeting, and again, for your unceasing service and dedication these past few months. The 181st meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned. I think I do this again, I can't remember. So, uh, see you all in June. <laughs>